Hi, I'm Jennifer Wild, and you're listening to Sober Exposure. If it's about recovery, we're going to cover it. It's like one big therapy session, but it's free. So thanks for joining our dysfunctional family as we uncover recovery with Sober Exposure. Let's go. All right, man, we got... We got season two of Sober Exposure, episode one, and it's Jennifer Wilde. I'm so starstruck. So Richard Patrick, you are our first guest for episode two, or actually season two. Season two, yes. And I was just talking to, first of all, can you hear the music we have in the background? Yes, I can. That's one of my, my, uh, my Moog jams. I love it. So... This is Richard Patrick of the band Filter, amongst many other bands, many other projects. Um, movie score. Is that how you pronounce Is that what you would say? Score? Movie. movie they, they would say I was a composer. A composer. Okay. I, I, whenever I do my credits, I'm always like music by Richard Patrick. It's, it's, it's a lot. Okay. It's, All right. Sometimes I'm writing a song. Sometimes I'm writing, you know, it's not just movie score orchestral i don't i don't necessarily consider myself a big orchestra kind of composer yeah. as it right were. that's kind of snotty Plus, um a lot of your songs have been in movies like i mean trip like i do how many i think that's been in a lot of movies that song that came out on the spawn soundtrack uh for the movie spawn okay yeah hey man no shots the 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 big yeah. one he that's that's in tons of movies yeah that's always yeah. getting work yeah that that, hey that song kind of did okay for you that was kind of welcome a, to a the big. fold uh gets yeah. a lot take a picture gets a lot yeah Trip like i gets a little bit it came out you know just for that soundtrack yeah yeah um all right, so I'm going to get a little personal here for one second. I'm, I'm not coming here as Jennifer Wilde, the podcast host, or Jennifer Wilde, the disc jockey. I'm here as Jennifer Wilde, the fellow addict, and Jennifer Wilde, the fan. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, we share Cleveland in common. Um, I was on WMMS. I was a DJ on WMMS right when you were recording Short Bus. And it was we spent a New Year's Eve together, 1995 into 96. And yeah. I went to the Cleveland Agora to go see the filter concert, the dude that was the guitar player for nine inch nails to see his band perform. And you could tell me if this really happened because the nineties were a blur to me. So, um, I think that I, I think that I had a really long conversation with your father. Now I remember you coming out on stage with a cast on your arm and like you were dressed real preppy. And I was like, Holy fucking shit what the hell is this the old like, the, the express the uh the look was old man <laughs> we were thrift store guys we would go to like thrift stores and get like old man outfits exactly like you guys were dressed like weezer before weezer you know like exactly right and it, that's funny old man i i mean it just wasn't like in the, back then everybody was like with the long hair and and the flannels and that just wasn't your look you know yeah yeah we weren't no, or the we sound, really but necessarily coming from that angle. Yeah, no, no, no. But I mean, you you rocked my ass off that night, and instant fan. And I was like, I could see why this guy left Nine Inch Nails, and thank God he did because holy shit! Like I heard the song, it makes me want to stick my dick in your face, and I was like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that was dose. And I uh, immediately got the record and was a huge fan. Uh, from from that day forward but i mean then i think that i i definitely remember i met your brother that's what i found out all about your brother and everything and who your brother was and all that connection um but i think that i had a really long conversation with your father do you know if your dad was at that show new year's eve oh, yeah. Cleveland? okay everybody was at that show and i and i remember waiting until midnight to come out like we waited until midnight to come out and I just remember my parents being like, Richie, come on, get out on stage and just play. <laughs> That's right. I was like, but I don't want to miss New Year's, you know? Yeah. Was, yeah. It's a, it's now, crazy. why did you have the broken arm? What was wrong with your arm? I tore a rotator, my rotator cuff. And I thought um, 
the best way to deal with it was just to put it into a sling and let it heal. But, um, it never really healed. Um, and it did, it did finally after I got off tour, but I used to throw my guitars all over the place and yeah. it would, you know, my guitars are like eight pounds, you know, mm -hmm. they're heavier than normal guitars. And, um, I have them made that way. I have them made heavier. And, um, I just like tore something and, but we, we just, you know, we incorporated it into the show. We were just like, yeah, it made it that much more rock and roll. Just right, like, yeah. that's what I mean. I will always remember that. Degrees. Yeah. When I, I remember nine inch nails. When I was in nine inch nails, Trent would tackle me every show, like somewhere <laughs> twice a show or once every other show, like he would always like tackle me. So I ended up really screwing up my, my knee and my ankles and I was always injured. Yeah. 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 I, I, and that, that had to have been like kind of a tough decision to leave a band like nine inch nails and to go on your own. I know like I'm reading Huge. Dave Grohl's book right now. And he talks about how when Tom Petty wanted him to join his band, he's like, eh, but you know, I, I kind of want to make my own legacy, you know, so I could either like go the easy way out and just, you know, be the drummer for Tom Petty, or I could just like, you know, go for it and make, my own legacy and be, you know, and look, yeah. what, look what it, you know, so. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was a pretty ballsy move back then. Cause you know, I, I had been in nine inch nails for so long, uh, you know, for four years. And to me, that was an eternity because I was so young. Mm -hmm. And um, I just remember thinking to myself, I, I either, I have to leave entirely or I have to just succumb to the situation that i was in which was just to be a hired gun guitar player that might be creative once in a while but is pretty much waiting for someone to to give him the permission to be creative and not that i have anything against trent or anything like that but it was it was a scenario where it was like well if i if i leave and i get a record contract on my own then at least i know i tried my my music you know and got out under his, his coattails and, um, and when Hey Man, I shot blew up and, you know, take a picture blew up and all the records did really well. I was, I was, I was kind of vindicated in the sense that it's, it's, it's hard, you know, you're leaving something that's massive, you know, that was on its way to being massive. And, you know, and I, you know, sometimes I wish I stuck around a little bit longer. Sometimes I wish I left earlier, you know, but yeah. like, you know, I, I don't regret a thing and I've, I've lived an entire amazing life with filter being the number one thing and my music, you know, mm -hmm. now for film, you know, the film scores I'm doing. So it's, it's, it was absolutely worth it for me. You know, was he happy for you or do you think he was kind of like, Oh, screw him. Or do you, I mean, I, I met trying to trilogy. Do you, do you remember trilogy? That club? Do you remember that? <laughs> no, I don't remember <laughs> it a, trilogy. It was a big club in Cleveland, and uh, what some guy from Nothing Records brought Trent with there one night, and I was like, you know, yeah, he was all right. But mm -hmm. uh, was he happy for you? At the time, he he took it kind of personally that I was leaving. You know, like what? You know, my nickname was Piggy. You know, <laughs> and um. The week I left, Brian Leesgang, who was, you know, working on the record mm -hmm. uh, before he came to filter, he calls me up like the week I left and he goes, Trent is writing a song called Piggy. Piggy, is that what I was going to ask yeah. you? Is that where the song yeah. came from? And yeah, that's from from my understanding, that's where it came from. And um, I didn't realize it at the time, but the song kind of comes off as like, a love song to a certain extent a friend like your friends leaving and it you know i lost my shit over you and stuff like yeah. that and i i didn't listen to the song for 20 years uh because <laughs> i'll never forget where i was i was literally getting gas at a in akron after i just bought some microphones to go record drums in my in my studio and um in my house in rocky river mm. and um a car pulled up and it's the a bass line that I had heard before I left. And it was like this swing bass line and Trent. And then all of a sudden he goes, Hey pig. Yeah. You. 
And I was like, oh my God, I'm in this remote part of the country. I'm in Akron, Ohio, for God's sakes. And he found me, a kid on a car, had a car stereo blaring, the speakers blaring. And I heard him, you know, kind of talking to me Wow. Uh, through his music. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it was Nothing wild. can take the neck because I'm yeah. not kid anymore. Yeah, anyway, I, I, that's off the downward spiral, at, right? Yeah. At the time, at the time, you know, we were both like young, like butthurt, like little kids that like, well, I'm going to do my own thing. You know, that, yeah. kind of, that kind of, yeah, you know just young people being hurt and you know our relationship was so based around like drinking and you know it was it was kind of crazy and and dysfunctional i would say to a mm-hmm. certain extent yeah so you know i i don't regret a thing i i there are times that i wish like man i wish i wish i could go back on a tour with with nine inch you know there's always that like yeah there's always that man it would be great to see my friends and and hang out and be friends with but the the cool thing is now is that with all this behind us trent and i are actually friends now and uh our kids have played together and you know i text him every once in a while he'll text me and what's up piggy or you know we just, oh really oh that's great Piggy anymore he doesn't call you piggy <laughs> but he called he, hey what's up rich and you know blah 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 and, you know so we're we're friendly and and cordial and and happy for each other and um, yeah he he paid me a nice uh compliment about hey man i shot a couple months ago he said something really nice about it just- finally how many years later really finally i get the compliment thanks Trent. But, really but yeah but you know it was we were we were butthurt little kids that were yeah. you know kind of mad at each other and you know we were sensitive and mm-hmm emotional and you know and we came off like bitches <laughs> that's all yeah yeah we came off yeah. like little bitches kind of i mean he he's in recovery as well now too so i don't know maybe we could maybe you guys could have the like uh clean and sober tour you know would that be yeah. crazy uh, who knows right stranger well, things I, I would be up for it you know yeah 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 i i i, I off air will tell you off air. I'm still, it's still the radio chick, you know, off air. We're not on air, but he, he hates me. I pissed him off so bad. He was, he was in town and he was at that club. And the next morning I was on the air, I guess I am telling the story. Um, the next morning I was on the air and I was like, yeah, Trent Reznor was at the club last night. And da-da. and then um, Tony Ciula, who I don't know if you know, Tony. Was oh, yeah, in I know Tony. Records. yeah. Yeah. He's like, Jen, what did you do? He was in town to go see Marilyn Manson do this show. And he didn't want anybody to know he was in town. And you just told the whole city that he's in town. Now he can't go to the concert and he's being bombarded and he's so pissed and you totally, uh, yeah. so he hates me. Right. <laughs> he was that's, so mad at me. I'm <laughs> sure that's temporary. I'm yeah, sure no, I know. Sure no, but it's my claim really to fame. Upset. Like, yeah. yeah, it was my claim to fame in life. Like Trent Reznor hates me. <laughs> I pissed him off. That's my claim to fame. Trent Reznor hates me. So anyway, enough about you him. Let's talk about where Trent really, I mean, he his lyric in that one song, Wish I Hate Everyone, you know. Yeah. It, it yeah. Was a, a point where Trent really pretty much did hate everyone, I think, <laughs> back yeah. in the 90s. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, he, he he's a very brilliant man, as, yeah. as are you, as are you. I mean, are this you? morning I was working out and I was listening to all your stuff and I was like, dude, man, just even from short bus all the way up, like everything. That's awesome. And I, I forgot like what a huge, huge fan I am of, cool. of, of your music, you know, I know uh, even I gotta, your side gotta, projects you, like with the DeLeo brothers, mm-hmm. uh, that that project you did was great. Uh, everything. So throughout. Yeah. The DeLeo, um, army of anyone. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That project in the that was early, early 2000s. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah. 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 So that yeah, that was great. Um. So let's talk. This is a the show is called Sober Exposure. So mm-hmm. most of the people that listen to this show are in recovery. And cool. so let's talk a little bit about that. Let's talk a little bit about your journey through addiction and sobriety and where it started and how it happened. And why mm-hmm. are all musicians fucking addicts? No, I'm kidding. Okay, it's very <laughs> true. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that. I'm going to give you the floor. I'm going to shut up. September, I saw that September 28th, 2002. Yeah. So I, 
had tried every combination of trying to quit drinking and I could not stop to save my life. And I finally was on the road and it, it had become so awful that I couldn't perform at the level that I wanted to as a singer. And I was slated to go on the road for like two years and it was going to be this long, arduous like tour across the world. And I could not see any other way of doing it besides w- without, without drinking. And um, that was when I realized like, this is absolutely a no go. And I started getting to a place of like, maybe I'll just kill myself or maybe I'll just jump from a building. And I remember looking at buildings and, and being like, well, if I got up that fire escape and I climbed up to that part and I climbed over and then maybe I could jump and, but would I hit the grass or would I hit the cement? Because if I hit the grass, I might just severely injure myself. And I was having these debates in my head and I just realized, I was like, this is just not a normal way to live and i had to literally stop everything and i just called up the bandmates i i called up everybody that was in my life and i said i'm going to rehab and i have no plans for the next like year because i i don't know what to do and i i have no idea how how long it's going to take me to get sober and then i i i canceled the tour and i um pissed off everybody in my band you know everybody was furious because they were all going they were you know going to be going on the road for two and a half years making a living Mm -hmm. and um so i infuriated everybody in my life except for like my parents who were like thank god you're finally doing something about your alcoholism and it was so like it was so relieving that like everybody knew and it was disturbing that like everybody knew. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the one thing about being an alcoholic that really is disturbing is that alcoholics are the last ones to know. <laughs> know that they're alcoholics. Yeah. Yeah. They're the last ones to actually physically, like mentally make the connection that yes, they are addicts and they have to do something. And so when I went into rehab, I went to promises Mm -hmm. and I am not a spiritual person. I'm an atheist and I'm, I, I'm someone that needs uh, facts and logic and research and, you know, proof that like, you know, something exists. Mm -hmm. And, um, there was someone there at rehab. His name was Chris, Chris Cornell. And when I kind of came to at the, at the rehab, like I was like, Holy shit, Chris Cornell from rehab, you know, from Soundgarden. And he was like, I'm in here too. We gotta, we gotta stay sober. We gotta try this thing. We gotta try and get, he, he had like 10 days and I had like a few, I had a couple days. And I found out that the program was a 12 step program and it was all this God that I considered. (laughs) Yeah. All this stuff that I considered to be like, you know, like I'm a vampire, Eh! you know, (laughs) don't talk to me about God, you know? And, um, I was going to walk out and Chris goes, dude, if you leave, you will never fucking come back. And he's like, and he's like, and you will, and you will probably end up dead. And from what you've told me, Rich, you know, and he said, this is the best deal in town. He said, Rich, this is the best deal in town. So I, I just sat there and, and, and listened and listened. And that's when I started to make like, like I started to make the connection that like, it's not really, about God. It's not really about, uh, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a higher power to your understanding. You know what I mean? Which is a lot more open 
And, you know, like, for instance, I envision my disease as like a boulder. It's like a huge boulder. Mm -hmm. So how do I stay sober and move this boulder out of the way in my life? Well, if I get 10 drunks that have been sober with me, you know, or who are sober before me, I can get that group of drunks, group of drunks, G-O-D. I can get that group of drunks to help me move this boulder and I can be free of this, this pain. And so I, it's the fellowship of, of Alcoholics Anonymous that propels me to be, that's my higher power is, is the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's the other people in the program that I can call at any moment in time and just be like, yo, I feel bad. How do I feel better? Mm-hmm. You know, well, let's go to a meeting or let's, you know, let's read from the book or let's, you know, let's talk, you know, get it off your chest, you know, like, you know, there's a lot of pressure in life, just, just releasing that pressure to another, but it has to be another alcoholic. It has to be another, yeah, it, or yeah, drug I, you know, it, 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 it can't, it can't, it like therapy, like, fall short because they're they're really they're smart and they're educated but if they're not truly an addict with me if they're not like someone that suffers from addiction i can't really feel i don't really feel and this is just me but i i don't feel like it's the same thing like i have to have someone that's been in the dirt you know yeah nobody can understand the shame of an alcoholic and addict yeah except for an alcoholic and an addict yeah Nobody uh, can understand how it feels to get naked in an airplane. <laughs> Hence the song, take, uh, take, take my picture, picture right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, life hands you lemons. Yeah, that's right. Make that's lemonade. <laughs> you know, that, <laughs> that propelled yeah. me through that, you know. Yeah, and, and I agree with you. And I've been, you're talking to someone that's been, uh, I've been in rehab 40 times, okay? So, and I'm not exaggerating, yeah. all right? Wow. Like, dude, I am not a, a one white chipper. Okay. So uh, like you, you're lucky and mm-hmm. God bless you for being able to go in there one time and get it. Cause I, I, that's not my story. Um, yeah, no. And, and, and it doesn't all. have to be, it yeah. doesn't have to be right. We don't have yeah. to have the same story. It's whatever way we, as long as we got it today and right now. It, exactly. I mean, I'm not, I'm not. I'm not where Chris is. Thank God. Thank God. Yeah, no, you know? that's yeah. So, so when imagine the guy that saved me ends up killing himself, you know, uh, and, he, and, he, and, and I saw the show that he played, he was definitely on something. There was, really? There was no question in my mind. He was definitely on something. Um, the, the night of the show in Detroit, in Detroit. Yeah. And Richard, I, 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 right after that happened, I, I read a quote or something that, that you, you had said and that, that he had saved your life. And yeah. I, I, I had read how torn up you were about that. And that's when I learned that you were in treatment with him uh, right after that. And I, I am so sorry. Yeah. I mean, really, I mean, I know it's been years, but that is something you're never going to get over. No. Um, and they, they did try and play it off like he, he wasn't high and that it was just, you know, Mm-mm. which which brings me to something else, which is addiction and mental illness, because. Mm. You know, after you put the drugs and alcohol down, you know, it's like which came first, the chicken or the egg, because, mm-hmm. you know, we addicts are, are we are we using because we're trying to cover up mental illness and our pain or is it like which came first? Because a lot of times for me, I am self-medicating my ADHD, which I, I have a feeling you, 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 you struggle with as well. And, um, my severe depression and and all of that shit, Mm -hmm. you know? So, um, mental illness with, with addiction, that's, that's one of the reasons why Mm -hmm. chronic relapse is so prominent, Mm -hmm. you know? So how, how did you handle that? I mean, I, the thing with going to rehab and the thing with, with sobriety, my main thing was that like when I walked into to rehab and I realized everything that I had just lost, I mean, I'd lost so much with, with, with filter and everything. And I just, 
I said, take a good look around because this is the first and last time you're going to be in one of these institutions, you know, in this scenario. And I just believed that I could do it. I believed in myself. You have to have a little faith in yourself, you, you know, um, but you, you also have to know that like, as bad as it is, as bad as life is, it's still way better than the alternative. And what's the alternative? Not existing. In, in, in my mind, there is no afterlife. There's the minute the blood stops flowing in, inside your brain, it, it's gone. You're this, the, whatever the spirit, the whatever. It's, it's a very bleak outcome. And so I have, to, I have to cherish even the worst days of my life. I have to like be thankful that I can experience you know, emotionally, you know, the human brain is so big. And the reason why babies are born very premature, like as compared to other animals, like, you know, if you're a giraffe, you're, you're, you have to walk in, you know, 20 minutes after being born, you know, like, you, like mm -hmm. they're, they come out, they're kind of done. But yes. human beings, the reason why our brains are so massive is because we carry emotion. And what I always thought was interesting was that the, the byproduct of being so emotional is the brains, it's the smarts, it's the intelligence. Mm -hmm. So I always thought it was the other way around, that we were intelligent and the emotional part was was the reason why it like was leftover stuff from when we no the emotion is why like we are so successful because if if you know a hundred you know a hundred thousand years ago if sally fell into the river holy you know holy shit we gotta we gotta save sally like that herd mentality of that that like save each other kind of warm you know love you know for lack of a better word love is what binds us together and and keeps us you know that's why we love our kids and that's why we yeah. we need each other even even the most you know stubborn old you know son of a bitch needs someone in his life you know like mm -hmm. needs someone to to be there and to reflect you know on life with you know and so i i i focus on that and um I I regularly go to meetings still to this day. I was going to ask you that still. Yeah. You still go to meetings. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 what I have to do to feel comfortable and to feel happy in life is 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 just check in with some alcoholics and and make sure I'm not full of shit. Yeah. Make sure I'm 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 dialed into my recovery. You know, and I've met some amazing people in recovery and um, the stories are just it's insane. Like, the, yeah. like, uh, you know, um, I'm sure you've heard a few, but like, you know, just the fact that these people are alive gives me so much hope after some mm. of the stories they've shared with me. And, uh, you know, so it's. Yeah, it's it, it's and the it's other a miracle that I, when you were talking about death and and the afterlife and, uh, you know, what happens and how you believe there's nothing. And I always I like to believe there's something. But the thing sure. is, is I died. I did. I died. And there was nothing. Mm -hmm. There was nothing. I mean, so um, I, I am a true miracle that I'm alive. Mm -hmm. I overdosed. I overdosed. I was freaking dead. That was it. You know, the, wow. the person that's sitting across from me right now, my producer, he, he brought me back to life. Gee. Uh, really? Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. But see, that's it's, the thing you, you've, you get to find out what, you know, the James Hubble space telescope will, you know, find out in, in, in three months, you know, like, You'll be able to see the next Star Wars. You'll be able to see the next sunset. You'll be able to see the next, you know what I mean? You know, yeah. I, all the little things in life, you know, whether or not it's a great seeing a great piece of music, you know, or a yeah. great piece of art or, yeah. you know, we're only on this little ball one time, you know, and 
the 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 last you know 10 years don't seem to be too awesome but you know there's you know there's you still got to get out there and rock and 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 do your thing and and life is we live in a very very crazy time right now yes we do <laughs> where truth is just obliviated you know by <laughs> news organizations you know just yeah. entire news organizations that are just lying you know, I know. I mean, about about really stupid shit. Like Richard, I know, and I know you're political. You know, I know, I know you're like, and I I just don't want to I don't want to scare anybody off. I don't want to go. I I I I agree with your politics. Yeah. I just can't go there because I don't want to no, you know. No, I, I out, but it's it's a fucking crazy time. Crazy it's time. A, it's an amazingly crazy time. Yeah. And yeah, I kind of have to stick around to see what's happening. You know, that's yeah. another reason, like what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, what is this, what is the, the season finale of America going to look like? You know, yeah. is it going to, is it going to come out? Okay. Or is it going to be. Right. And we, we need you to stay. We yeah, need you, democracy, we, you know? Yeah. I mean, I find it's a responsibility for, for me on a daily basis to stay on the beam because I feel that the world needs my voice out there yeah. really, you know, the world yeah. needs your voice. Well, so, so the, the, here's the other thing that keeps me sober. I have received thousands and thousands of messages from alcoholics in need that reach out to me on Facebook or Instagram. And it has happened so many times where literally someone's like, how did you do it? And I'm, mm -hmm. I went to rehab and I went to AA meetings. Not that everybody has to know that's what we do, but like, that's like, that's what I did. I went to meetings and I, and I listened when I didn't want to hear it. And I, I hung out with people that were sober a lot longer than me. So I could understand how they're doing it. And I, I, I took it all in and I give them that my story, just my basic story. And I'll get these messages. Like there was a VIP person that came back that bought VIP tickets to the, to the show. Mm -hmm. And he came back and he goes, do you remember writing this? And he holds up his phone and it's me saying, do the work, you know, just go to meetings, find someone who's sober and, you know, and, and fake it till you make it. And, you know, just all the, all the, the normal advice that you would give someone, not 